Just yesterday, she found a place that's not too far from where I used to live when I first started coming here in the Staten Bridge area. Amen. Amen. We're glad y'all back here. And God is good all the time. Yes, sir. And all the time. God is good. Yes, Amen. Um, anyone else have an announcement?
If not, let's just go to the Lord in this time of prayer. Ask him to bless our time as we enter into worship today. Father, we thank you for blessing us, for being with us here today. We know your word tells us that where two or more gathered in your name, you'll be there also. And we know that even if it's just one, you're with us. So we thank you, Lord, for today. Be with us. Guide us as we worship. May the songs that we sing be lifted up to you as, as a joyful noise in praise. Our prayer be com communicating with you. Our praises for you and our, our um, needs and our thanksgiving for meeting those needs. Then as we look into your word, may it speak to us. And as we go forth then this <coughs> afternoon, may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart each and every day, each and every moment, be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.
go to sleep because running through your mind, it just keeps over and over and over. Or when you're at a meeting, try to stay awake. Yeah. Happens then as well. Um, the upside of this is that we can't stop thinking. Even if we wanted to, our thoughts can kidnap our attention and keep us from appreciating the simple things in life. Now this morning we're going to look at a passage of scripture and in it we're told that we think sometimes thoughts that cannot happen. Now I want you to look in Romans chapter 2, book of Romans chapter 2, and we're, this morning we're going to see that there is no escaping God's judgment. Romans chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, and we'll be um, reading through verse um, 11. And I'd like for you, if you would, to stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. Romans chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are, who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to the truth against those who practice such things. And here's the verse. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, for glory honor and immortality but to those who are self seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness indignation and wrath tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek but glory honor and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek for there is no partiality with God and you may be seated as we listen to these words, as we read these words, you have to back up into verse chapter 1 just a little bit to understand the concept Paul is presenting here. Because in chapter 1, Paul lists 21 sins that the Gentiles were guilty of. And, and as he listed those, I'm sure the every self-respecting Jew who, who was within hearing distance of, of this letter or these words, um, they were putting their thumbs in their galluses and saying, boy, I sure am glad I'm not, not like that. I sure am glad I'm one of the chosen. I sure am glad I'm, I'm not like them old filthy Gentiles. <coughs> well, it's pretty cool what Paul does. He builds up those Jews just to knock them down. And, and that's what he does here in these verses we read. He says, well, now, wait a minute now. Do you think you are going to escape God's judgment? So we look at this passage, 
and we see there is no escaping God's judgment. First of all, um, the Jews sought to escape God's judgment um, on the following grounds. One, the Jews sought to escape God's judgment on the grounds that, of their relation to Abraham. They, they, we are sons of Abraham. We are children of Abraham. Um, we are chosen. Then they also thought to escape God's judgment on their possession of the law. God gave them the law. We've got the law. So we're Abraham's children and we have the law. And then on the covenant that was made of circumcision. So Abraham's children, we've got the law and we've been circumcised. Hey man, that's our ticket. And so we see then that they also thought about, well, God has given us so many things in the past. After all, he led us out of bondage in Egypt. He provided the way to the promised land for us. And then we do good works. You know, the Pharisees had taken those 10 laws and turned them into over 600. And as the Jews kept those 600 laws, they were doing good works. They thought that was adding up in their treasure in heaven. And also, they relied on the ancestors. My mother and my father, they were, they were fine Jewish people, and so I am too. And, and their ceremonies on the Day of Atonement, they kept all the laws, the ceremonies, the feast days. And so they thought, I'm good. I got my ticket punched. And Paul wanted them to think that. He said, see, see, read, listen to what he said about the Gentiles. Go back to um, chapter 1. He starts out there in verse 29, and he says that your unrighteous sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, mal sufficiousness, I don't, I don't know what that one was, <laughs> full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, whisperers, backbiters, hater of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. That's sort of thrown in there, I guess. <laughs> un you're undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Goodness gracious, what we, how would you like to raise a child like that? Ooh. Or be married to somebody like that? <laughs> now, now, you know, don't raise your hand if you are. But, <laughs> but we look and we see all these list of things he's talking about the Gentiles. And then he comes to chapter 2 and he says, well, I want you to know this applies to you too. You know, the Jews thought to escape God's judgment on those grounds. Well, men in general, Jews and Gentiles, think to escape God's judgment. Um, there's a song that was written many years ago, and it was... Um, made famous by the Oak Ridge Boys. And that song was very sentimental, oh, it had a feel-good feeling to it, but the theology in it was rotten to the core. Because you had this man who was dying and he, he had been a sinner and done all these things, and it, the song's name was, Come on in, you did the best that you can do. Folks, that is not what Scripture says. Amen. And now a lot of folks got that confused with a "Come on in, baby, take your shoes off, come on in." You know, that, but but that's not the one. Okay, <laughs> this one is one that's hard to find, but it's there. And 
says, I'm telling you right now, this world has swallowed that hook, line, and sinker. Amen. Men in general will not escape God's judgment, not through their wealth, not through their power, not through their exalted position in this world. They won't, they won't escape it in poverty. They won't escape it in insignificance. They won't escape it as religious professionals, church membership, or sacred office. You cannot escape the judgment of God. Amen. Some say, well, you know, as long as you're sincere in what you're doing, folks, you can be sincere all the way to hell. That's right. And there are people every day that are sincerely going yes. to hell. That's right. Say, oh, but, but I treat people good. Well, good for you, but that don't cut it. Nope. So we look at this passage that, that we read here, and we see that God has given us some instructions, and he's telling us that, look, you won't escape judgment by your, it doesn't matter how many preachers you had in your family. It doesn't matter how many times you go to church during your lifetime. It doesn't matter how many times that, that you have, have given your tithes, your offerings. It doesn't matter how many prayers you lift up or fasting you have or almsgiving you have. That does not take the place of saying, Jesus, I am a sinner. I know you died for me. Come into my heart. I confess my sins to you and come into my heart and I'm going to live my life with you in control. Amen. Folks, that's what Paul's trying to get the folks to understand here. You look at it and, and it's pretty interesting what he says because <laughs> we look at all these things like the Jews did and like people today do and, and, and we think, well, you know, I, I'll get an exemption like homestead exemption or something. You know, we think we get homestead exemption in heaven for what we do on earth. Don't work. Does not work. Because Paul says that God's judgment is based on truth. The truth. So, it is impossible to escape God's judgment. In 1934, a prison in San Francisco Bay was opened called Alcatraz. They had originally 137 inmates brought in, and it ran until 1963, 29 years of operation now, the reason it closed is because, say, in Atlanta in 63, the cost to house a prisoner for a day was $3. In Alcatraz, it was $10 a person. Now, that's a big, big chunk. But, so anyway, in the 29 years, Alcatraz claimed that no prisoner successfully escaped. There was a total of 36. 36 prisoners made escape attempts, made 14 attempts in that 29 years. Of course, two men tried it twice. They, they didn't learn anything. <laughs> 23 of these people were caught alive. Six of them were shot and killed. And during their escape, two drowned. But then there are five listed as missing and presumed drowned. Now that's one where if you watched them, the, the 
Clint Eastwood movie that he he was in. Um, no one knows. There has never been positive proof that any of those guys made it. Oh, there have been, you know, conspiracy theories and all this kind of stuff, but there has not been a body found. There has not been conclusive evidence. So you look at Alcatraz, there were a lot of folks that tried. 36 tried. Don't have evidence of anyone making it. Folks, it, it is more impossible to try to escape God's judgment <laughs> than it was to escape Alcatraz. Deborah and I had an opportunity to go. And when you, you go on your tour, go into the kitchen, they have the menu of the morning they close, still up on the, on the wall in there. And prisoners ate pretty good, man. I was over about the time we left. <laughs> But we think about that. We cannot escape God's judgment. God says it is appointed man once to die, and then what? Yep, judgment. The judgment. Yep. The judgment. So as we think about that, the Jews, they were solemnly warned that they would not escape. And during this time, the Jews and the Gentiles were, were warned that the only escape from God's judgment is through Jesus Christ. The guilty flee. The pardon alone escape the judgment of Christ. You know, there is not one person who will escape God's judgment that was not a sinner. Scripture says, for all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. Yep. Scripture says, and the wages of sin, that's death. Now, how many of you retired folks and folks that are still working expect or expected to get wages for the time you worked? Right. Or did you work just work for free? <laughs> Anybody work for free? Um, if you did, come over to my house. I, I need to hire you. <laughs> but when you work, you earn wages. When you sin, you earn wages, and that wage is death. Right. But the good news is while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's good news. Amen. That is excellent news. Scripture tells us then we've got all that information on, on escaping God's judgment. The only way is if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart, God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. I love, I love the Romans 10, 13 because that word shall is pretty interesting. Circle that word in your Bible because that is a promise to you from God. That if if you confess Jesus as your Savior, if you believe in your heart, God says if you do those two things sincerely and genuinely and honestly and with everything in you, then you shall be saved. That, that word shall, it doesn't mean you could be, ought to be, would be, should be. It means... I always ask folks when I'm witnessing to them and, and we get to that part, I'll say, after they pray the prayer, I'll say, now I want to read to you something. And I'll read 10, 13. Say, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, 
And I asked them this. Did you do that? Did you honestly and truthfully do that? And if they say, yes, I did, preacher, then I say, I want you to read the next part. Because it's not the preacher telling you you're saved. I can't tell anybody they're saved. Because I don't know. But if they do what that verse says, God says they're saved. So how do you escape judgment? Impossible. Outside of Jesus Christ. You have a better chance of swimming from Alcatraz to San Francisco in those shark-infested, freezing, current-ripped currents than you do. So, this morning, this morning, let me ask you this. Do you know that you know that you know? Look at yourself and, 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 and ask this. If, if God, if you breathe your last breath and God you get to, to the gates of heaven. God says, why should I let you in? What do you think you'd say? There's only one answer that God will accept. You want to escape judgment, there's only one answer. I believed in Jesus Christ. He saved my soul. Do you know? Have you ever gotten to a point in your life when you did that? A lot of folks say, well, I've been a member of, of the church for 169 years. That don't matter. That don't matter. <clears throat> well, I've been a deacon for 50 years. That doesn't matter. Well, I've been a preacher for 30 years. You'd be surprised when I was going to Bible college, the number of preachers who were saved. Well, my father, my mother, my wife, my husband, folks, being saved is the most personal thing you will ever do. It's something that no one else can do for you. Amen. So this morning, can you say, well, preacher wasn't preaching to me this morning because I'm saved. Well, praise God. If, that, if you can say that, that is what I want to hear. But if you don't know, if you're not sure, if you have questions, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Yeah. And this invitation this morning, Lynn's going to come and play. And as she comes and plays, we're going to stand, we're going to bow our head, we're going to close our eyes, and I want you to, to look as if you're looking at a miracle. And I want you to ask yourself, am I saved? How do I know? And if you say, I don't know, you need to come. It's an invitation. You may have family members that you need to pray for. You can come and, and pray for them. Whatever your need this morning, the Lord is here yes. to answer. And they say, well, preacher, you know, we want to join Allen Creek. Well, come on down. You may say, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm backslidden. I know I'm saved, but I haven't been doing what I need to do. Okay. You know, we're so like Price is Right this morning. Come on down. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you right now, we ask that you would speak to us.